There are thousands of videos and websites to help millions of IELTS candidates pass their exams each year and get those high band 7, 8, 9 scores. These tips, strategies, and tricks that you see online are not always helpful. Some of them might be true, but in fact, they actually hurt your scores. Others are blatantly false and given just to get clicks. In this video, I will explain how to assess the value of the information that you're given and some of the most common misleading advice that you see online. Let's begin. I graduated from the University of Victoria in Canada with a degree in psychology and with distinction, meaning I was at the top of my class. I have been teaching IELTS for nearly 20 years, and I specialize in psychometrics, the measurement of human thought processes, which falls directly in line with the IELTS exam, or assessing language proficiency. So, should you believe all of the information, the strategies that I give you for the IELTS exam? Maybe, maybe not. Just because I'm an authority in the IELTS does not mean that I might always have the correct advice. Humans generally source information from four factors, or from four places. Number one, through empirical evidence, or scientific method. This is the most reliable. It means that it is true because I have experienced it to be true. I tested it to be true. And this is also the case for the IELTS. If you find a strategy that works for you and you consistently get good scores, then use it. But if you don't, it's time for a different strategy. The next place of information is authority. As I just mentioned, I'm a British Council agent and an IELTS test creator and trainer for nearly two decades. That means I do have a lot of knowledge in relation to the test, but do I have all the knowledge? Do I have the best knowledge? That could be questionable. Just because I'm an authority doesn't mean I always have the right answer. What you should do is test the advice that I give you. If it works, use it. Our third source of knowledge is majority opinion. This means everybody says it's true, so it must be true. Everybody says that skim reading is an effective strategy for the reading section, so it must be true. But is it? Just because everybody says that the Aliens are attacking Earth, does that actually mean they're attacking Earth? Or is it just mass hysteria? Majority opinion is less reliable than the scientific method or the authority opinion. So be cautious. Just because some videos tell you that there's a popular strategy which works for the IELTS, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Finally, our fourth source of knowledge is our intuition. I feel that it's true, so it probably is. I feel that this strategy might work for me, so I'm going to use it. This is considered quite unreliable. You should always be very cautious to base your strategies on your feelings. Instead, base your strategies on facts. If the strategy yields 30 and higher marks in your listening out of a total of 40, or on the reading you're getting consistently 30 out of 40 or more, then it works. If not, it doesn't matter what you feel. The strategy is not working. Again, remember, scientific evidence, the empirical pursuit, you experience it to be true, so it's true. That's the most reliable. Authority opinion. The IELTS expert said it, so it's probably true. Majority opinion. Everybody's saying it, but I'm not sure until I test it. Intuition. I feel that this will work, but I better test it before I use it in the real exam. Keep these in mind and always rely on logic. Check the documentation. In this video, in the description, you will find a list of links which give you documentation for linguistics, English literature, 
essay writing strategies that are the facts behind much of the IELTS exam and the way that examiners measure and assess your English proficiency. On our website at aehelp.com for academic IELTS and gieltshelp.com for general IELTS, we strive to implement the scientific method and give you strategies and tips that are based on empirical evidence. We have had thousands of students use our strategies and consistently show that they are improving their English and getting higher scores. To join our premium package, simply click the red button on the website, aehelp.com or gieltshelp.com. Let's continue with some of the most commonly found advice for the listening section that might be true, but not necessarily helpful. Underlining and circling key words when getting ready to listen to the audio is useful. This may work for some candidates. However, for many others, this will be a distraction and can actually lead to a lower performance. The reason being is that much of the audio, especially in part three and four, are paraphrased. So you will not hear the exact words that you see in the questions. Rather, you will hear different forms of paraphrasing, and at times, not even the synonyms, but instead, a description. So instead of looking at specific vocabulary, it is often better to look at the entire phrase and visualize the information. Use your energy and time for comprehensive understanding of each question and the topic, and to picture yourself within that topic. Don't be distracted by circles and lines. Another misconception in the listening, and this is also true for the reading, is that answers have to follow some sort of pattern, meaning that in the multiple choice, if the answer for one question was A, then likely for the next question it could be B, C, or D. This is not necessarily true. You could have an IELTS listening section where you have three or four multiple choice questions where each of the correct answers are A or B. There is no set pattern to the answers. So keep an open mind and focus on comprehension. A lot of videos and common practice for every section of the IELTS, including the listening, is the attempt to predict the information on the test. This is simply shooting in the dark. Yes, you might hit one or two ideas if you're very lucky, but chances are the topics in your next IELTS exam will surprise you, meaning that you will not be able to predict them. So don't waste your time trying to find predictions for your upcoming exams. Instead, focus on strategies. Once again, in our courses on our websites, we always emphasize strategy while presenting you with a variety of topics on environment, technology, and society. Yes, familiarize yourself with general topics that are common to all people around the world, but do not expect that you will know exactly which topic will come up on your next listening test. Now, let's talk a little bit about reading. The most common misconception and false advice for the reading section is, there's not enough time to read the passage and the questions, so you should use skim reading. Look at keywords and scan the passage to identify the information. This is blatantly false. Any person who has a band level six in reading ability for the IELTS exam should be able to read the passage. If you are not able to read the passage in 10 to 12 minutes while understanding at least 60 to 70% of the information, it is not yet time for you to sit the exam. If you do, there's a very good chance that you will be guessing and wasting your money. The correct strategy to get those higher band scores, especially eight and nine, is to read the passage at least once. Yes, you can skim and scan for answers, but only after you have read the passage. 
there are 11 different types of questions that you might see in the reading section. These questions are designed in such a way to negate skimming and scanning. For instance, in true-false not given questions, it's virtually impossible to figure out if the information is given or not given if you haven't read the entire passage. In order to find the correct list of headings, you have to read the whole paragraph. While it's true that the topic sentence may contain the information for the correct list of headings, this is definitely not the case for the introduction and the conclusion. Skimming and scanning, again, are only effective once you have read the entire passage. Another common misunderstanding is that answers in the reading come in the order of the passage. While this is true at times, it is not a guarantee. The answers may be randomized. This means that if you get a matching information question, which is, which paragraph contains the following information, the very first question might be contained in the last paragraph. Other question types, like multiple choice, might also not follow the structure of the passage. This, again, supports the advice that you need to read the whole passage. Just imagine skimming the entire passage to then discover that the answer for the first question is found in the final paragraph. You can see how skimming and scanning can easily waste a lot of time. Instead, what you should be doing is reading each paragraph, stopping for a moment after each paragraph, and thinking to yourself, what is the main idea of this paragraph? Like with the listening section, do your best to visualize the information. Let's discuss the fallacies of the writing section. Task 1 and Task 2 essay writing in particular is plagued with bad information online. This is primarily because a lot of the people giving the information have little to no idea about the standards of English essay writing. Many of them do not even know the basic concepts of persuasive, expository, narrative, and descriptive writing in the first, second, and third person voice. But the examiners are certainly aware of these principles, and they're checking, because these are understood by college and university students. This information is learned at the high school level. If you're not sure what I mean by persuasive, expository, narrative, descriptive writing, and first, second, third person voice of the author, you need to learn these, and you can, in our online materials at aehelp.com and gialtshelp.com. So, what a lot of instructors do is they take information from other instructors who have taken this information from others, and so on, passing on this bad information. Ultimately, they try to teach candidates templates. Use templates to get a high band score. Although this information might be somewhat true, this advice is blatantly false. IELTS examiners do not award band 8s or 9s to template type essays. Rather, they are looking for effective arguments within the standard essay structure. The worst advice is often found with Academic IELTS Task 1, not only because this is an expository essay written in the third-person voice, but also because a lot of instructors giving advice for Task 1 Academic do not have clear understandings of charts, graphs, and statistics. Again, when you're writing an effective essay for task one, you need to have a basic understanding of when to use bar charts or what type of data uses line charts. You will know that line charts are used to show continuity or change over time from the years 1980 until 2010. You will also learn that bar charts are used to compare nominal data or name 
data, like countries, Canada, Japan, USA. You will also learn that pie charts are used to show proportions from a whole, or better said, percentages from 100%. Once you understand the purpose of charts and graphs, you can write much better essays. If your instructor does not know this information, it becomes extremely challenging to teach this topic effectively. Again, use your better judgment. Another common misconception for the writing section is that you need to use fancy vocabulary to get those high scores. While it is true that range of vocabulary is one of the marking criteria for the writing section, fancy words do not necessarily get high marks. Too often, I have seen IELTS candidates use idiomatic language, expressions, vocabulary, phrasal verbs incorrectly. When fancy words are used in the wrong ways, instead of making your scores go up, they will make them go down. So the advice here is use words that you know. Be confident that you're using the words correctly. Even with relatively simple words that explain the question well, you can still get a high band score of 7.5 or even more. Last but not least, keep your introduction simple. There is absolutely no rule in English literature to support this statement. And I have never heard an IELTS examiner say that I gave a high band mark because they had a simple introduction. Rather, the introduction is the foundation to your essay. You don't need a long introduction, but it certainly needs to be more than just a simple paraphrase of the question stating that the essay will discuss the advantages and the disadvantages, or this paper will explain the benefits and negatives. That is not good writing. In order to get high band scores, your introduction has to capture your reader, introduce the topic of the question, and outline at least two clear points that you will further discuss in the body paragraphs. This is the expectation in college and university level papers. And band seven to nine match that level of writing. Again, you don't have to believe me. Check the links in the description and you will find the sources that explain the expectations of quality persuasive essays in English literature. It's no different for the IELTS exam. Keep in mind, IELTS is not a foreign language test of English. It is a proficiency test used even by native speakers for university entrance if they do not have their high school English marks. Arguably, no section of the IELTS exam gets more attention with online videos and training than the speaking section. And this is no surprise because speaking is often the greatest source of anxiety for test takers. So they diligently look for effective strategies and ways to practice their verbal communication to get those high scores. Unfortunately, this also means that the most false information or potentially true but harmful information intended to get viewers to click on videos and websites is found in the topic of the speaking section. I'm sure many of you have found videos that target specific vocabulary, suggesting that if you use a set of three or four particular words, they will help to improve your speaking scores. This is blatantly false. A good English speaker who gets a score between six and seven will have a vocabulary base of two to two and a half thousand words. A person who has a score of eight to nine will easily have a vocabulary base of four to five thousand words. Now it's not just the number of words that you have in your repertoire, but it's the way that you are able to use them, to string them together in coherent, complex, 
and natural sentences to effectively communicate with your examiner. Simply using fancy words like plethora will not get you bonus points. Also, a lot of these videos are watched by thousands of test takers, so the examiner will hear many students using those same five fancy words. They catch on quickly. By the time their third speaking interview takes place and they've heard the word plethora used for the fifth time, they realize there must be a viral video out there telling everybody to use these words. Rather than focusing on fancy vocabulary, spend your time on making sure that you can use your existing vocabulary effectively. Another true yet harmful advice found online is that body language doesn't matter for the speaking section. I don't need to be a student of psychology to tell you that body language is an intricate part of communication. Even though I'm not moving my hands, just the way I wobble my head and move forward gives impact to what I'm saying. You will notice that any effective content creator and presenter uses a wealth of body language to support their communication. Yes, it's true. The examiner does not have little boxes on their sheets that they need to check off or body language. They are technically or officially not marking your body language on a scale of 1 to 10. Uses body language well or does not use body language at all. In that sense, it doesn't matter. But in the sense of your overall performance, your confidence, your credibility, your coherence, your fluency, body language has a massive impact. And any communication coach will tell you that body language is critical in human interactions and very important for scoring or doing well in oral exams. This is no different for the IELTS. You should not ignore your body language when preparing for your IELTS speaking interview, nor should you ignore it during the interview. Your body language is intricately interlaced with your verbal and spoken language. By mastering command of both your verbal and body language, you become a more effective communicator and guaranteed you will get higher band scores. So don't pay attention to the advice that tells you to ignore body language. Do not go to your IELTS exam and sit with your arms crossed and closed off like this. Just think about it. This posture itself puts pressure on your chest and makes it more difficult to breathe. By keeping your hands under the table, by fidgeting your feet, moving your legs up and down, shaking your shoulders, you express that you're nervous. You confuse yourself. You hamper your fluency. Body language is important. Keep your hands on the table. Use them to help you express yourself. They can even buy you time. For instance, when you're lost for thoughts, you can stop yourself for a moment, think about it, and then continue. Your body language continues fluency. Sure, you're not being officially marked for that, but overall, it will be reflected in your score. Keep this in mind when you continue your studies. Last but not least, certain people advise that in the speaking section, you just need to be yourself, be natural, have a conversation. Absolutely not. This is a formal exam. Your goal is to show your best English communication. A band nine candidate is an expert user of the English language. It is not a friendly chit-chat with your pal at the coffee shop. Yes, it's absolutely a good idea to use natural language. Yes, you can use slang words. You can say wanna and gonna. At the same time, it is also important to show the ability for formal language. 
say going to and want to before you say gonna and wanna. Use full word expressions. I am glad to meet you before you use contractions like I'm glad to meet you. It's okay to use natural language, but use formal natural language in combination with casual natural language. This will show the examiner your full range of ability, just like a native speaker. When I meet with my friends, I speak differently than when I meet with my colleagues or my superiors. We choose our language according to context. The examiner is not your pal. Keep that in mind. Do not give short answers. You need clear explanations and smooth examples. What is your hobby? In my leisure time, I enjoy reading books. It helps me to relax. Yesterday, I started a new novel, The Life of Pi. This type of answer gets you high scores. It's natural and it's fluent and detailed. If you simply say, I like to read books, you're getting a band five. Concise language is not the same as short language. Remember that. In the speaking section, show formal and colloquial English. Learn many more useful strategies for all sections of the IELTS exam, including six original practice exams, a fully interactive course, more than 200 lesson videos, and an app for your phone. Use the code EFFECTIVE9 for an additional 10% discount. Simply click the link in the description below. It is a one-time payment for lifetime access. We are an IDP affiliate, a British Council partner, an IELTS Test Registration Centre, and as I mentioned, I'm a certified British Council agent. We help thousands of students every month succeed on their tests. Just listen to what this candidate has to say. Hi, thanks to IE Health Materials, I got a 7 overall in the IELTS exam. Now I get to work in my dream job in any country that I choose. Thank you, IE Health. Begin learning for success. Join now. Subscribe to our channel. Click over here. Watch another video. Click right up here. And click our IELTS Hero to join our premium package and get access to all of our videos practice exams, and a fully interactive course.